Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Train Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. We have a new guest with us. It's never been on the podcast before today. We have endur- or first endurance is Zach Calton. Zach, good to have you. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Really excited to yeah. be here. I'm. We're going to intro you in just a second. We also have your ex-teammate, Ryan Standish, with us. So uh, it's good to have Ryan. Rocket Sloth Co's, uh, Scott Bikes. Let me think who else? Endura, Pit Viper, uh, Oscar Seal. Blues, Kenda. Orange Seal. There we go. <laughs> yes, Kenda. <clears throat> I think I got them all. So uh, it's like Ricky Bobby over here. So, uh, but Ryan <laughs> Standish, good to have you back, man. Newtons. <laughs> good to be back. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still there. working on the fig Newtons across my, across my glasses, but yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, okay. So we got this question. This is like a couple months ago, but, uh, it's perfect for the opportunity. It's from Ryan and Ryan, Ryan, maybe this is you and you're just like sneaking in questions (laughs) this way. Uh, and maybe you just wanted to be on the podcast with Zach, but it says, look, I love Keegan and all, but I can't relate to aliens that seem to not experience the effects of altitude. (laughs) Can you get some other lifetime Grand Prix athletes on? I really enjoyed hearing from Ryan Standish on your recent episodes. And I was hoping we could hear from others like Zach Calton. Howard Grotz, Braden Lang, even Brennan Wirtz. Uh, I would love to get um, Brennan and Braden and Howie, although Howie might just like tell us that like he doesn't train and he just like rides with mountain goats for like 17 hours a day. And that's how he does it because I think that's how Howie rolls. Um, could be interesting just the same, but yeah. It's something but, like Well that. then, Ryan, uh, question submitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question submitter, Ryan, not Ryan Standish. Let's get to know Zach. I came up with a list of questions that's absolutely comprehensive. And after these questions, we will know everything about Zach, only the important details. Uh, Zach, what's your FTP and your Watt KG? Uh, my FTP is around 350, uh, which puts that, oh man, I got to do some math here. Let's see, 350, <laughs> like five. 5.55 looks like. Nice. Don't forget that. Don't, don't forget that 10th. I like it. Favorite, no, least not. favorite type of workout. <laughs> so your favorite oh. and your least favorite. Yeah. My favorite would just be like a big long ride with just like some tempo efforts in there. Um, you know, nothing super intense, but like five, six hours where you can go, you can go places, you know? get those in on the weekend uh mm-hmm. that's my favorite type of ride uh least favorite is gonna be like a five by five vo2 or something just like super <laughs> super short and intense like that where you're just kind of like hurling over the bars afterward nah, I think that, reason. yeah y- universally hated maybe five by fives <laughs> yeah yeah there's yeah. a reason we don't do uh we don't race cross country anymore <laughs> It's because we hate the workouts. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Aww. laughs> it's hard, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Five by five stuff. Okay. Uh, on bike hourly carbohydrate intake and in what form? So what do you shoot for in terms of grams of carbs per hour on the bike? Yeah. I mean, I, sh- I shoot for like 120 in a big race. I mean, I think it heavily depends on what uh what your event is and what your training ride is i don't think if you go out for a one hour recovery spin you need to take in 120 (laughs) grams of carbs in that hour but if you're really pushing it yeah like 120 is like the upper ceiling and then kind of decrease it from from there based on based on need and what is that is that in in like the spectrum of ho-hos to gels or drink mix yeah yeah lots of mostly drink mix if i can and then i'll i'll supplement with a little bit of with a little bit of gel um and then in training yeah lots of ho-hos and uh cosmic brownies are my (laughs) go-to but ho-hos are good too cosmic brownies are i think the densest calorie item maybe on planet earth they're like this big and they're 400 calories pretty sick <laughs> uh, they are cosmic you know yeah they're yeah. cosmic <laughs> so, not yeah. of this yeah. world <laughs> uh, but yeah i mean honestly in races i know a lot of people will like unbound or leadville or these big races will take like gas station food like that or whatever you want to call it um i can't really get it down typically so i stick to drink mix and gels in races 
Nice. Uh, favorite discipline in terms of cycling, like racing, because you, uh, for background on people with Zach, sorry, I'm going to interrupt this really quick and explain, uh, Zach, I've known of you for, geez, I don't know, I guess as long as I've known Ryan, because you two were teammates and you race cross country. You're racing on a Cannondale team. The two of you guys, I think you were sponsored by Cannondale. Um, but you've raced cross country, but I also have seen you race crits and road races, cyclocross and gravel. So which is your favorite? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really digging the gravel right, right now. I think it's a ton of fun. I love the tactics of it. I love my XC background and that's what I started doing. That's what got me into the sport. But, um, I like the dynamic that gravel offers. So I know some of the guys from the mountain bike background are like, they're doing gravel because it's what's happening right now, but they really love the mountain bike. And I still love the mountain bike. Don't get me wrong, but I really like, like tactical gravel races. I think it's a ton of fun. Nice. And when I got to know who Zach was, it was because he was Ryan's teammate who for some reason at all times was manualing, like never on two wheels, always on his back wheel. And he like had a, I feel like you had a cast on for like a year too. Yeah. And you were still manually with like a cast on, probably not even able to hold onto your bars very well. Yeah. So. I broke my scapoid was, uh, three time, or scaphoid three <laughs> times that year, which is like a heinously slow <laughs> fracture to heal. I guess it doesn't get good blood flow. So yeah, I think it was 36 out of 52 weeks in a, in that year in a cast. Oh so. But you could still ride after. And a he was weeks always manualing. <laughs> He was always manualing, always, except yeah, that one time. <laughs> that one time he borrowed my bike <laughs> and went to do it. Really nice, man. <laughs> I run my the right I run my job. brakes the other way, <laughs> so he just went <laughs> straight <laughs> over the back. <laughs> yeah, it's a good trick. Yeah, yeah. I run moto brakes too, Ryan. It's like an anti theft or anti cool guy device. Like, don't get on my bike and act cool. It's gonna bite you. You know. Um, all right, uh, your favorite race, Zach. Who, um, that reminds me the, the place we were when I fell over on my back on Ryan's bike was Missoula pro XCT. And I love that race. I haven't done it in years since 2019, uh, just because I'm not doing XC so much anymore, but that was always my favorite race. And that definitely would have been my answer for years. Um, but I really like crusher and the tusher suits me well. I won it once. So it's like, you know, just got fond memories of it. Tend to do well there. Have had it actually struggled there this year, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I really, I really like that race. It's my home race in the Grand Prix. So it's just like quick drive down there. And I, I think it's a really pretty area and I, I just really like the course. Nice. Uh, favorite place to train? Uh, snow basin in Ogden, Utah. Um, just like love the trails it's where I learned to ride a bike. So that's my, that's my spot. Nice. All right. And the thing you've learned in the past year that has had the most impact on making you faster in the past year, I would say taking the recovery days more seriously for sure. Um, I would get prescribed a recovery, like an active recovery ride. And I would more treat it just like a one hour endurance ride. And I think actually like when you're recovering, recover. If you're going to work, like put in the work for sure. But uh, taking the the rest and recovery seriously, and like polarizing the difference between like training and recovering a bit more, has helped me a ton this year. What does it feel like when you are doing? A, like, what are the things that you recognize or feel when you are doing a true recovery ride instead of turning it into an endurance ride? Um, yeah, I mean, on the ride, it's just, it just feels crazy easy, you know, like you, you have to like plan out the route, you know, like if it's a, too steep of a hill, like you got to avoid it. Um, and it, it's, a, you know, maybe a bit boring in some senses, but it's also, I mean, throughout the season, you go through so much, uh, you put, you know, pressure on yourself to perform and in workouts and races and all these things. And it's, it's nice to just have these days where, you expect nothing of yourself. Like you're just going out, smelling the flowers, whatever, like just take it super, super easy. And, uh, like sometimes I'll go out on the e-bike and my girlfriend Lexi will be on a normal bike. Like we'll like switch it up. Um, 
and it's just a, it's a good opportunity to just chill. So I like that. Nice. Uh, I'm stoked to have you on Zach. Uh, you're a person I've admired for some time now. Like, uh, you seem to have a very heads up approach to your racing and you're very like, uh, able to get a fair perspective on it. Um, I don't mean to make you blush or anything, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of how you race and how you go about your racing also. Um, and Ryan, I don't mean to pitch you as like, again, like Ricky Bobby, you know, like the, 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 the massively supported racer or something like that, because Ryan, you're, you're also financing a lot of your own program. Um, uh, but in this case, Zach, like you have one sponsor, uh, first endurance and thank you first endurance for supporting athletes like that. That's super awesome. Uh, if anybody's listening to this and wants to support first endurance, so they get the message that they can continue supporting Zach, please do that. Maybe even send him a message and let him know why, uh, but you are like, it's I mean, you're basically as privateer as privateer gets here, Zach, like doing this lifetime Grand Prix. This is your first year in the lifetime Grand Prix. Um, you, I applied, went through the same process everybody else did. They selected you. Um, I guess, uh, has it been, has it been harder than you thought, easier than you thought, or what's like been the biggest dissonance going into this experience for you? Yeah, it's, um, luckily I have a super awesome family, like, um, and I know everyone has an awesome family, but they are super like, they know the situation I'm in. So they make huge efforts to be at the races and support me. So got, got mom or, or my girlfriend or my sisters sometimes, or my dad in the feed zone, uh, handing me bottles and, you know, lugging my box of tools. Like if I did have a mechanical, like I would be the one fixing it, but they make sure everything's there for me. Um, so that helps a ton. So I still do have like a support crew around me and I work at specialized. So I, you know, get, get some discounts or whatever from being in the industry. Um, so I, you know, it's maybe not as difficult as if I was, if I didn't have these connections or didn't have a family that could, that had the opportunity to help me out. Like I'm super lucky to have that. Um, and I, I, you know, I've been doing it for years because, because even in the XC days, it's like, yeah, maybe I was sponsored and had like, you know, a custom kit with all the sponsors on it. But once you have a bike, like I wasn't getting paid. So I was financing all the travel and, you know, registering for the races myself for the most part. And, um, Ryan knows this and just, you know, figuring out the logistics ourselves and trying to find someone to help us speed like Carson city off road, 2019, you fed us. We'll never forget that. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, you just make it work. Um, and, uh, do your best. Same as everybody. That's awesome. I dig it. Uh, Zach, you recently, you were at gravel Nats, um, caught up in a huge pile up. Uh, your bike was all mangled. Your parts were all mangled. Do you have everything you need to keep racing? Cause honestly, I'm kind of thinking like maybe there's probably people listening to this that are <laughs> missing parts and be like, Hey, I got something. No. Yeah. I actually posted something on Instagram. Like I posted the list cause I like took my bike apart and inspected everything and posted the list of everything that broke. And it was like both wheels, derailleur, shifter, frame, handlebar, probably forgetting something, but it's pretty, pretty <laughs> like solid the list bike. of things. <laughs> Yeah. Like basically <laughs> needed a new bike. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's funny too. Someone messaged me and, uh, said, at least your stem's okay. But then I have a one piece handlebar and stem. And I was like, Nope, <laughs> it's actually broken <laughs> along with the bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, I've, um, uh, like I said, working at specialized, they've supported me a ton. Like got our, our, wheel building service, uh, in house. And they're hooking me up with some new, with a rebuild. Um, and they, they helped me oh, get a new cool. frame. So yeah, just got to buy a, a shifter and a that's derailleur, awesome. I think at this point. So, I mean, still stings a bit. Those, these, uh, these electronic derailleurs aren't getting cheaper, but, uh, yeah, like, well, I'll be okay, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Cause I posted that thing too. And a ton of people were like, I have a, CAD six, you can use if it helps, you know, people were just offering whatever. I was like, Oh That's my so gosh, cool. you people are so nice. But yeah, I think we'll be okay. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, that's good to hear. 
uh, Ryan, uh, what's, what's the next race for you? And then also for, I guess, Zach, we could after Ryan, but it's probably the same race. Ryan, what, what's, are you it doing Schwamigan this week? Yeah, we're, we're up here in Wisconsin for, for Schwamigan, but I know, I know Zach's here, nice. <laughs> yeah. um, which yeah. is the sixth, I think sixth round of the lifetime Grand Prix. Am I getting that right? Yeah. No, fifth. Wait. Five. Yeah, there's yeah. three more. We've done four. There's three more. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think it's the shortest one of the year. So it'll be interesting. Nice. Is it, uh, it going to be muddy on you guys like it was last year? Uh, question Not. mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it looks, <laughs> it looks like it's <laughs> yes. uh, forecast, I think, is for rain tomorrow. But Saturday looks... Uh, Saturday looks dry, so we'll have to see. Good. I think last year there wasn't rain in the forecast and then it dumped (laughs) and it was super muddy. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Muddy and slick on all that grass and stuff. So, well, uh, we're stoked to have these two with us. You send in questions this week. Uh, you did so at trainerroadcom slash podcast, whatever training questions you have, send them in. By the time people listen to this, you'll already know how they did in Shawamigan. Uh, and you'll already know, uh, that things have passed. This is being recorded a week in advance. Um, but just the same, go find them, support them. It'll be good stuff, but submit your questions again at trainerroadcom slash podcast. Let's run through a handful of them that people have sent in for you guys. Um, we're going to go to Scott's question first. Scott says, Hey host, could you give me some coping mechanisms for threshold work? Since I signed up for trainer road and started using adaptive training, I'm able to compete complete threshold workouts successfully for the first time, which has been a game changer, but I still feel like it absolutely takes everything out of me from a mental and emotional perspective. And here's the thing. I can do the numbers in racing and group rides, but when it comes to doing 12 to 20 minute threshold intervals and training, whether inside or outside, I just feel absolute dread. To give you more info, when I started training, I did a 20 minute FTP test for a coach and averaged 327 watts. So he gave me an FTP of 330. And that's when I learned to hate <laughs> threshold work. Poor guy. He's been traumatized. <laughs> I think that's right there is, is what the problem Backward. is. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah you don't go oh, up man. from your 20 minute power typically it's a five percent reduction from that uh yikes man scott i'm sorry um uh i hate to hear that so um and i just want to clarify he just signed up for trainer road recently so this is not <laughs> like this isn't a mistake uh, by us here so um years later i'd realized this was not a correct ftp and that i should have been working closer to 315 but the mental damage seems to have been already done at that point I've gotten faster since then, and these days, AI FTP detection has me at an FTP of 339, and I was able to recently average 335 watts for 49 minutes on the trainer, and that's, he mentions at 3.1 watts per kilogram and says that I'm a big X linebacker. So to me, it doesn't seem like my FTP is too high. I just can't seem to remove the dread from threshold training. Have you had this sort of problem with your threshold training or maybe some other zone? I can't believe I'm typing this as it seems like the most first world problem ever, <clears throat> but what can I do to build a quote, healthy relationship with the training zone or what can I do to just make it less miserable? Uh, Zach, do you want to start off me? I don't know if you sympathize or empathize with this at all. Yeah, I definitely, definitely do. Um, for me, I think every day is different. Some days you you feel super ready for the workout and you're just ready to smash it. And on these days, you know, probably, probably don't need advice. You just go and hit your numbers and it's fine. Uh, but on days where it is hard, especially, um, like typically you'll be prescribed as a zone, you know, for your, for your threshold workouts. Uh, you know, you've got a little leeway on the top end and bottom end. Um, I would just shoot for the bottom of that zone or adjust it down. Like just, m- just a tiny bit if it helps you get started because i think worse is if you've built a training block or a training week around this session happening and you just don't do it uh, because you're dreading it that's that's worse than dropping it two or three percent to make it achievable and especially if you just do that for the first one you can you can like negative split the whole workout because you didn't bite off more than you could chew on the first one mentally or physically and then get those 3% on the back end or whatever, if it, if it helps you. Um, but as long as, if you can 
you know, lower that power target to make it mentally easier on you just slightly, you're probably still going to be training your lactate threshold really well, but you actually get started, you get into the workout. And then once you realize like, oh, I can do this, you know, you, you, you have the proof from your first set, you'll probably just bump your power back up to that, you know, middle or top end of the zone for the, for the next sets. Yeah. Ryan, how do you, do you struggle with threshold work like this? Or do you have like workouts that like weigh heavy and loom large? For me, it's VO2 that I absolutely hate. Um, And I kind of do what, like what Zach said, like even if it's 5% lower, you're still, you're still working that zone, even though it might be the bottom end of it. And also, like Zach said, if you can, if you make it through one or two of those, you're like, okay, that wasn't so bad. Then you can ramp it up a little more, ramp it up a little more. Um, I think for me, threshold, it's not, I like tempo the most, kind of like Zach, the tempo workouts are, are sweet. But I think threshold, for me, it's always like that last five minutes. It's like the, the last quarter of the interval that really like, it's hard to keep keep the cadence up or keep keep the power in the zone. So probably because I don't lower it a couple percent to start with. So I'm like <laughs> riding at the top end, and then at the end, it's like. <laughs> um, but I I could probably learn from that, like in the threshold stuff, and start a little lower. And then if you can if you can ramp up in a threshold interval at the end, then then that's super super solid and i think the other thing that especially on key workout days almost treating it like a race like basically eat what you would eat before a race and fuel for that workout as though you're fueling for a race because that like i know i struggle fueling during training racing and then racing it's harder to get that routine if you haven't built it during the training. So I think having one or two workouts a week that you treat like a race, like eat your meal a couple hours, eat a good pre-race meal a couple hours before, and then doing your high carb um, fueling plan during, during the workout, I think gives you the best chance. Um, And I think that mental side too, where you, if you treat it like a race, then you're going to like have that. It's harder to treat a trainer ride. If you're like working out, work out on the trainer, it's hard to treat it like a race. But, um, I think that if you can switch that mentality to once or twice a week, then you go into a race more prepared as well, because you've already put those systems in place. Mm -hmm. Is that, how do you, do you guys ever find that you're almost like involving too much emotional and psychological energy into a race though? Like, or sorry, into a, a training session. Like you almost like you fixate it on some uh, fixate on it so much that you end up building it up into something like that. It isn't like you make it bigger than it needs to be. Cause I could see that Probably. being the case here. We have, you know, Scott. Yeah. Scott's like, I hate threshold work. It's so hard. I can't do it. Well, and then coming into every single threshold workout that I, I, I would assume that it would have a tendency to become a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You could, yeah, I mean, uh, if that you could go that, the other way too, not treat it like just like go into it. Ah, it's just a, just another ride. <laughs> and then, <laughs> well, don't look at what your ride is before you go and then load it up on your, on your <laughs> garment. Yourself. Like, Whoa, <laughs> here's what we're doing today. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I got to go to the gas station, get some candy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zach, what do you think about that? Like almost letting, getting too deep into it, letting it get to your head. Yeah. I, I definitely think you can get in your head if you, if you sit and uh, toil in it all day. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a balance. I think, you've got to find what works for you. I, I find myself more in more in what Ryan said. I think I gain confidence from like, okay, I ate everything right. Like I'm like, 
I'm prepared for this workout because I thought about it and I, you know, did the things I need to do to perform. So I'm going to perform. Um, that gives me the confidence to go for it. But if that just makes you dread it more because you're just thinking about it all day, then yeah, I would, I would definitely just try to try to relax and just treat it like, like any other workout. And then I think like combining those two tips where, where it's like, you know, if you need to back it off to achieve the workout, you know, set like a larger goal of, okay, the next five threshold days, I'm gonna finish like for sure. Like, I don't know if not finishing is a problem for this guy, but I think especially if you can look back on a big training block and it's like, I did all five of my threshold, uh, workouts in that training block. And I hit my numbers all five times or I completed the workout to a certain degree of, uh, accuracy. Like you have this body of evidence that you can do it. And so you gain confidence from that too. Mm -hmm. Scott, there's two things that stand out to me. Scott says he's a big X linebacker. Um, I would likely assume that you're quite muscular, Scott, like you, you probably have the ability to snap and to push and to have like that sort of fast twitch strength that most of us cyclists probably don't. As a result, it could make sense if it feels more difficult and foreign to do that sort of work. Um, threshold work is intentionally hard. Like it's difficult. That's the nature of it. Sure. Um, but especially if you're coming from like, uh, you're kind of like pulling yourself toward that work, it could make sense even more. So for like, just for when we're talking like from a fiber type composition perspective, but I think I've seen a lot of athletes get too hung up on specific zones and they forget the fact that your body is a system of faders, not a system of switches where it's like, it's not like once you enter the threshold zone that you're in totally fresh and unique territory and that anything outside of those ends is just like totally different. It's your body is using its aerobic system to create power, right? And it's starting to use more of its anaerobic system as well to be able to make power as you're getting close to threshold. And that's just what's going on. There's a bit of an interchange in terms of how it feels. Yeah. Like it should feel difficult, but you have to remember too, Scott, you can probably do, like you said, you're doing 335 Watts for 49 minutes at a 339 FTP. That's awesome. Like really good job. And that is something where you can take confidence from that and be like, okay, so it isn't just that it's quote threshold work and that's tough. My body can produce power aerobically and a high amount of that power relative to my threshold for a long period of time. I can do it. So if you quit thinking of it in terms of like a threshold day and instead you just erase the zones from your mind, so to speak, and you're just hitting the targets dwelling within that range, like Ryan and Zach have said, I think that can be helpful. Cause it's, it's crazy how we like stigmatize certain zones for ourselves. Uh, and even just like we hear about it from other people and it starts to form a narrative that then defines how we do in our workouts probably doesn't necessarily, that, that isn't necessary. Instead, it's just, you're performing and it should be adjusted, especially with adaptive training and stuff like you're using Scott, it'll be adjusted to your ability levels. So but yeah, that's my, I guess other coping mechanisms, music and the right type of music too. Like for me, if I'm doing like VO two workouts and stuff, this may be really like probably too detailed, but for VO two workouts, I like like more metal or like punk, like skater punk from back in my days, like, you know, in the, like the two thousands and nineties. And then if I'm doing threshold work, I can't stand it when a song finishes mid threshold interval. I know that sounds like <laughs> really picky, but yeah. I listen to like electronic DJ mixes that last like two hours long or something. And then that way I know that there's not going to be a lull and I can go for like my 20 minute intervals and like, I'm going to have something going the whole time. And that allows me to kind of enter that, that really cool state when you are doing threshold work, when you just feel like you are, you can settle in and just hold, it's not comfortable but you can just hold there and you kind of find that, that quotes sustainable, <laughs> uh, place to be in. And that man, it, it makes a huge difference. So like having the right music, like I said, just having no interruptions is a big thing that helps me. And for threshold stuff, there's no way that I'm going to be watching a show or a race or something. I, I can't focus on it, but for some people, maybe that's what they want. Like that's when you'd want to turn on something longer that would just be in the background, something like that. That's what helps me. Do you guys have any other like little coping mechanism mechanisms that you do to make the workouts easier like that? I can't think of any, anything else I do like this year. I've found myself like I'll count 
in my head, <laughs> like one, mm-hmm. two, like yeah. to my cadence. And I, like, if I'm struggling, huh. it's not a, it's not a conscious thing. I'm just like, start counting. I don't know if that helps me or what that's, what that's about, but um, I thought I was the only one. That's what's happening in my head. <laughs> one, two, three, four, and just like yeah. all the way to a hundred and then start again. Do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't always start at one. I have a few. Sometimes I'm like 27, 28. <laughs> <laughs> to your music point, I have a few playlists that are like timed. Like I have a 20 minute playlist, a 30 minute playlist and a 40 minute playlist for various things and so i'll like go to that and it's the same songs that like you know so maybe it gets a bit repetitive so i'll switch it up just slightly but i'll like actually check the length of the song but you can listen to the music and kind of like know like oh this song comes like mostly done and then i just have this last one and the last one can be whatever song like gets you going the most and you can like look forward to it and kind of get a feel for that playlist I've done that and it helps me. Nice. Like that Sep Coos playlist that's going around right now. <laughs> we, while we're recording this podcast, all three of us are hoping that Yumbo doesn't do anything dumb and they continue to help <laughs> Sep win. Uh, please do it. Please guys. Uh, and by the time you listen to this, you already know how the Vuelta has ended. So let's just hope it went well. I think that everybody's on that page. So a GC cuss is where we're at. So, um, Okay, uh, I want to go into Dvyam's question. It says, hey, Trainer Road, long-time user here. My question is, are antacid tablets like Tums a suitable substitute for sodium bicarbonate? The taste isn't as bad, and it's cheap as well. Thanks. Um, that's a good question, Dvyam. And so I th- there's, right now, as of when this video is published, if you're subscribed to our YouTube channel, you already saw it. But if you haven't, you need to go check it out. I did a deep dive on this. We did experimentation on three different athletes here at Trainer Road, including myself. Uh, we, and I did a huge amount of research into this. Uh, so for sodium bicarbonate, and if it makes you faster, go check out that video. But do antacid tablets compare to that? Because so I'm holding right here. This is like the Martin bicarb thing, uh, if you can see that. And hot dang, is that expensive? Uh, it ends up being like, like if you were to take it for like two hard workouts a week and maybe you had like a hard group ride or a race that you did and you did, so like you took this three times a week, it'd be $230 a month is what you'd have to spend. (laughs) So like insane how expensive that is. Uh, yeah. Anyways, we break it down in that cost and everything else in the video. So check that out. But it's appealing to think that antacid tablets or tablets could, could be used interchangeably for this. But first, before I do that, have any of you two ever taken sodium bicarbonate before training or before any sort of race or an effort uh, to try to help with lactate buffering? I've taken the AMP human lotion, which I think that was their claim as well as that it would could absorb through the skin. Um, mm-hmm. They also had, um, uh, I forget the word that for the heating effect. Um, and that's what, that's the only yeah. aspect I noticed, but I didn't do like back to back, like AB testing or anything like that. It was just, I put it on, my legs feel a little warm, you know, that's nice. Maybe the sodium is getting through. I didn't feel anything super crazy, but I also have a very little body of evidence uh, to work with. I have not taken ingestible bicarb intentionally. Yeah, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> This makes me laugh because maybe you'll remember the TT at I do. Valley of the Sun. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I don't remember if that yeah, was I actually do. baking soda or if it was flour that I just like. I think it was like pancake full, mix or something. Like a full <laughs> cup of pancake mix in my mouth and just like. <laughs> 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 he was um, laughing and trying to keep it in and it was blowing out of his nose. It was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, and I, I had used it before, like actually used uh bicarb soda. Um but did not notice again, like Zach didn't do actual um kind of strict testing with it had just like, I, I understand 
with from my exercise physiology degree that I haven't used in a long time. Um, but <laughs> the the buffering effect of that on um, buffering the acid in your muscles, basically the hydrogen ions. Yeah. Um, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That's the but, premise behind it. <clears throat> but I know there, and when you asked if we wanted to come on here and this was a topic I had to go like, see what's an antacid. Cause I couldn't remember, but I did see that those ones like Tums and Rolaids, I think use uh, calcium carbonate, not sodium bicarbonate. And that sounds like it doesn't um, doesn't work. And the other thing that I know is the the amount of sodium bicarbonate you have to ingest for it to be like scientifically proven to do something. I think it was like the equivalent of twelve Alka Seltzer tablets. <laughs> the Alka, <laughs> Alka Seltzer yeah. is not a good a good way to get the sodium bicarbonate. <laughs> You want to just like mix that straight in a couple glass of water. Yeah, uh, let's cover both of those options. So antacid tablets uh, like Tums, they're just calcium carbonate that does help neutralize stomach acid, but it does not work in the blood like we're talking about to neutralize an acidic environment in your blood. Uh, it's a thousand milligrams of calcium carbonate um, in each little tablet that you have. But again, it's just not going to give you the benefit at all uh, of, of muscle burn. Instead, it's just going to calm your tummy. Uh, even then, if you're taking that in, but you don't have an upset stomach, and then you're doing something like, you know, you're taking in drink mix or anything else, it's going to affect digestion, most likely adversely when you're in an active state working hard and then also taking that in. So it's probably a bad idea. Alka-Seltzer is the other one. And that one, here's, the, here's like what Alka-Seltzer has. And then also uh, the breakdown of pros and cons for each one of these things. And for those that don't know, like these are like seltzer tablets that you drop into your water, they fizz up, um, and then it's commonly given to people when they have an upset stomach. That's like the most common usage of it. So the first and main ingredient is uh, anhydrous citric acid. And there's a thousand milligrams of that in each little tablet that you get of Alka Seltzer. And it's basically citric acid. And that's key in when we're talking about like the ATP production process, but it isn't likely to significantly influence this process in the sort of dosages that you're getting with citric acid and for it to get to your muscles and for it to work in that process, it's just really not going to happen. And in most cases, most of us have that on board enough and we're able to generate that and it's just fine. So it's not going to help you out in the ATP process. Uh, so that part of Alka-Seltzer isn't helpful. And the cons to this is that it causes gut distress. Strangely, if you were to take it at the sort of like dosages where you would want it to help your gut, it would likely cause, or sorry, help your muscles. It would likely cause gut distress. Next is aspirin. There's 325 milligrams of aspirin in each one, each Alka-Seltzer pros for that pain management and anti-inflammatory inflammatory, forgive me, but the downsides like, you know, regular use could cause gut issues, uh, increased risk of bleeding and may impair adaptations. Um, We'll get into aspirin and pain relievers in a bit after this, but it's likely not going to help significantly. And then sodium bicarbonate. It has 1,916 milligrams, which is listed as the third ingredient on Alka-Seltzer, which is interesting, but just the same. Uh, so it has about 2,000 milligrams, but you'd have to take 10 Alka-Seltzer uh, tablets just to get to the point where you might theoretically have performance improvement. And then like Ryan said, you'd likely have to take 12 or maybe even above uh, to get to the point where you're taking in 300 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, like we're, like we're talking about for a lot of athletes. Cause that's typically where you really start to see the sort of changes 200 to 300 is where you start to see improvement. And, uh, if you like do that, um, I mean, watch the YouTube video. I, we talk about like the sort of thing when you take in too much sodium bicarbonate, if you don't take it in, in the right form, it causes intense gut distress. Like, uh, I did this for this video and the research that I was doing. And I was just sitting here at my desk, like two hours before an hour and a half before my workout, just like constantly burping, like uncontrollably is just like a two hour burp. And it was, I just felt like I was going to throw up. It was so bad. Uh, and the whole time I'm like, yes, I can't wait for this really hard workout that I'm going to do of 30 thirties to go test this out. Like, <laughs> and it was not, not, uh, I was just trying to motivate myself. It was the worst way that I could have prepared for a hard workout. 
So uh, neither of them are good options. Um, sodium bicarbonate little tablets that you can take, like the 650 milligram tablets, you can buy a bottle off like Amazon or some sort of bulk distributor. You can take those uh, to take them in the sort of quantity you need. Make sure that you are writing down how many milligrams you need to take in and make sure you don't confuse that with grams because that's like a, could be a bad situation. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so you, you want to make sure that you're getting that sorted. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that will not end well. Um, but still the amount of tablets you have to take, watch the YouTube to figure that out. It's a lot. Um, with all that said, those aren't sadly, they aren't good substitutes. Um, but I want to know on the aspirin side of things, uh, I think this is a safe space. These aren't water banned substances. This is like a common thing that you see a lot of people taking that sort of thing. Um, some people don't take it. And some people that are probably doctors that are listening to this are probably really like worried to hear the people take it, but I want to talk about pain relievers and how common their usage is in like cycling races or like really hard training. Cause depending on who you ask, when you look at like rider biographies and they're looking back at it, it's quite common for a lot of people at the top level of the sport to when tramadol was going through its era. And then after tramadol, it's going through and taking like just extremely like powerful pain relievers and SEDs uh, that people are taking in. Uh, it sounds like it's a risky thing to do. Um, at the same time, it's something that people do. So I just wanted to talk about from your guys' perspective, uh, Zach, uh, are pain relievers a regular part of your like intake during a race? Um, and, uh, or have you heard about this being something that people are doing at the, like the grand, lifetime grand prix level? No. Um, I don't take any pain relievers before, during, or after anything. Uh, like if I crash or something, I might take ibuprofen, um, but in very reasonable quantities just to deal with inflammation. It's not even so much pain relief. It's more, I think, trying to help inflammation. Um, but yeah, as far as anything about, I've never taken aspirin or any other pain reliever, and I've never really heard of anyone in our circle doing it either. Um, so it's, yeah, no, not, not a real, not really a thing that I'm aware of. Yeah. Ryan. Same, same for me. I think there was, I remember in, in college when we were like, we were looking at NSAIDs and, and also, um, acetaminophen, which is Tylenol as pain relief and, and utilizing that during prolonged exercise. Um, but then the the downside, like it's not good for your, I think, liver or kidneys, um, depending on which mm -hmm. one you use, um, especially if it's hot and your body's already trying to process or do a lot of other things to keep you, keep you going. Um, and then the other downside, using them like after, like post-race for inflammation, like or post training for inflammation, it reduces your body's response to that training. So you're not as you're not going to get as much out of the training if you're using NSAIDs or aspirin or um, ibuprofen, whatever after after training to help with inflammation and soreness. Then, like that that inflammation and soreness is your body's response to what you're putting it through, and that's going to make you faster in the long term if you don't take uh painkillers to to work with it yeah. so so that's uh, i guess from the, the scientific of, side but <clears throat> yeah i've heard that um like uh i can't remember whose book this was was it wiggins book or something like that and they were talking about like their tt cocktail effectively and like they were taking huge amounts of tylenol or um, you know, who knows, maybe they were taking tramadol and that's what they were just calling it Tylenol. I'm not sure, but it seems like a really risky thing. And certainly something that like for us, average athletes, uh, we get a lot of questions about taking NSAIDs like during, uh, during activity to cover that sort of stuff. And I just think that if you're looking for honestly, like just be more consistent with your training, fuel your work, and you're going to get better results than taking those painkillers. And you're not going to get any of those downsides. Like, um, man, uh, it's the hardest thing is to be consistent with training. So I get that. Like that's, that's the challenge. Um, but at the same time, if you can make strides toward that, it's going to pay off in, you know, dividends instead of taking something that could compromise. So, 
uh, yeah, Sarah's like, question. She says, hello to my, f- oh, Ryan, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, I think like Zach said, it's, it's one thing if you crash and are, or are injured. And I think that, uh, and said, especially if you don't take that stuff very often <clears throat> are super effective with pain for pain management, even like recovering from a broken arm or broken something like if you don't take pain like uh what do you call them off the shelf over the counter pain medications they they're really effective if you don't use them often mm-hmm. they work really well so yeah i think for for pain yeah. management and it's wild how injuries it wears it's off. A, yeah yeah but that was my like if you, if you go into this and you're just taking like 800 milligrams and you're like, yeah, 800 milligrams, no issue. But then you start like, like taking it habitually. You're like, oh, I need 1200, <laughs> you know, and it starts like totally. ramp up real fast. So you can take like, yeah. you can take 400 if you never take it and you're like, oh, this stuff's great. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Sarah's question. She says, hello to my favorite podcast people, five stars on every app I can rate. And thank you for sharing so much helpful information with all of us. Our pleasure, Sarah. Uh, Sarah mentioned rating the podcast. If you're listening right now, it'd be huge. Rate it on Spotify in particular. That will help more people find the podcast. Uh, Or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, like the video, comment down below, uh, subscribe, all that stuff. So Sarah says, I'm an ex-runner triathlete gearing up for my first cyclocross season. And I have a question about the best way to build repeatability. I have a lot of experience with interval training in different forms from high school and collegiate running. And since cross country was my main focus, I did a lot of training aimed at improving repeatability, including things like 200 repeats with 15 second rests to exhaustion, traditional hundred meter run, walk sets, tempo sprint sets, and of course, good old fashioned hill repeats. But I feel like in cycling, all I hear about is quote 30 thirties. And I find myself wondering why so basic. <laughs> What are the different read fun ways I can build repeat repeatability on the bike and what are the best ways to build it for cyclocross? Thanks. Samil, uh, Zach, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? Like, do you have any personal favorite ways to, to do that or ways that you think are the best for cyclocross? Uh, yeah, I mean, intervals are really good. So as you know, like that, <laughs> that is definitely key, but it's I 30 think thirties, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thirty thirties are great. Um, yeah, in addition to that, though, I think um, <clears throat> I think ra- like racing your way into shape is a really fun way to get that same stimulus, that same repeatability, and really, you know, put that uh, you know get get that exact stimulus that you're looking for. Um, so, if your goal race is you know some regional cyclocross race find, find a midweek cycle cross race in the, you know, weeks and months leading up to it, um, and get, and get that practice. I know some people, especially with cycle cross races being like 45 minutes, they'll, you know, they'll hop in the, in the, like in the masters and the a flight or, you know, the C and the B flight back to back or something like that to like really push it, especially like midweek races are pretty short, like even shorter than a short cycle cross race. So, you could probably get away with, with doing two, um, every once in a while. Um, you know, if, if you typically, if your typical schedule is like, Oh, Thursdays, I do a group ride, you know, see if you can get, um, you know, like a solid 10 minute effort in prior to the group ride and an hour of spinning just to get increase that time in zone. Cause if you look at, you know, your time in zone after like a dedicated interval session, you'll notice like you get a lot of time in whatever zone you're targeting, but a group ride, as much as they feel really hard or just like going out and riding hard, um, you really don't get very much time in zone despite like the perceived effort of it. Um, so if you can find a way to get more time in zone, uh, for whatever you're targeting for cyclocross, that's going to be like, you know, zone five, six plus, um, you know, find a way to increase that time in zone. I think your repeatability is going to go up. Yeah. The uh, Ryan, is there a favorite type of workout that you have that helps you build repeatability aside from 30 (laughs) thirties? Well, I was thinking back to what Sarah said about the, like 
doing 100 meters on, 100 meters off, for like 200 on and then 15 seconds off. And <clears throat> that to me sounds a lot like 30 30s, but it sounds, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. a longer name. So it's like, oh, there's more to it. Uh, <laughs> sure. But also doing like 20 40s or 40 20s, like doing a longer, mm -hmm. like longer sprint with shorter recovery time um, or a shorter and harder one with a little more recovery time. And I think mixing those in with 30 30s, like do one block of 30 30s, one block of 20 40s, one block of 15 15s. Um, so I think that, and then that hits like different uh, aspects, I guess, of repeatability. Physiologically, you have, like you can go harder for 15 seconds than you can for 30, but then you have less time to recover to do it again. Um, mm -hmm. And then I don't know if I have to see if this actually helps repeatability, but kind of over unders where you do a minute at like a little above threshold and then three or four minutes at tempo and then a minute at, at a little above threshold and then do that for 20 minutes. Um, and I think that is a pretty good simulation for, for cyclocross too, because you're like, you have the surges where it's a climb and then you, when you race, you have to recover at tempo. So, um, I think that is also a, a good, good workout for those short, high intensity races, because it is similar to like, if you can do that, uh, one minute above your threshold for all four of that, that block of intervals. And if you can keep it at, at tempo in the little recovery parts of it, then you'll be pretty well set up for, for racing. Yeah. One of the main goals of repeatability and building it is lactate clearance. And so there is kind of a broad spectrum, like you said, over unders that have you just working just above your threshold and dropping back down below also working on lactate clearance, but those are also working on like muscular endurance and plenty of other things that come with sustained work. Whereas those shorter efforts, you're also working on like your ability to replenish stores in addition to clearing out byproduct like lactate. So there's like, there is a wide spectrum that you can work on. And the cool part is lactate clearing is such like a high priority with that, um, that you can do it in a lot of different ways. My personal favorite way to build repeatability is to have those, uh, like reduced amplitude billets or float sets as we call them in trainer road. So that's like, you know, 15 seconds at like high VO two and then 15 seconds at tempo. And then like, you'll do that for five minutes <clears throat> and then, you'll, you, know, you may have like 30 seconds as a, like a tempo spot in between the 15, something like that. There's that undulation. Those are my favorite ones, particularly when we're talking about cyclocross, there's a workout called Zalibu that I love that last week, actually on the podcast we showed on screen. Um, but it starts out with like a super hard 30 second effort. And then after that 30 second effort, what you do is you settle in at like sweet spot and then after that, you're doing your 15 second repeats where it's 15 seconds high VO2, then 15 seconds sweet spot. And that's your set. But that really hard start, I feel like that really helps um, with cyclocross and that sort of thing. It makes it fun. But the other thing that you can do to make it fun, like we were talking earlier, Ryan, like counting out his pedal strokes and he's going through an interval doing that sort of stuff. Like you can fun. do like little mental tricks <laughs> to trick us into that. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but we can do like mental tricks to kind of help with that. And like, uh, I've even like, I've been with riders and they do like, if they're, you're in a spot with like a bunch of traffic or a bunch of trees, like I had one uh, person, they were like, I'm attacking every time I see an Aspen instead of a pine. And like, <laughs> so like you can kind of set like silly rules to like, just make it so that you go that way. You see a red car every time, then that's a new attack. I don't know. Um, a blue house, something like that. Like you can set these different things that make it so that it's a bit more fun, um, to do that can do it with music too. Um, you can make it so that like every time the chorus hits that you have to uh, like do a hard effort during the chorus. Then after that, it's like, you know, something different throughout the verse, lots of different ways that you can mix it up, but those aren't really unique to cycling. I think if you're talking cyclocross, honestly, the best way that I've found like, yeah, 30 thirties are super helpful. You can do like the anaerobic step style workouts, or just like a ladder where it's like the shorter efforts are higher intensity. And then it steps down in intensity, but every time it gets like lower intensity, it's a little bit longer and you kind of like work your way from high intensity and short 
down to lower intensity and longer and then work your way back up. And that's like a set. Those ones are always tough too, but that sort of, uh, that sort of training, honestly, that and float sets are just so good and like engaging and hard to, hard to beat for cyclocross. So not just for cyclocross too. I feel like that's the sort of thing you need to be able to put up with those really attacky group rides, criteriums, road races that are going to be tactical and tricky, um, cross country mountain biking. It's like super versatile and it's more exciting than five by five VO two. Uh, like we <laughs> talked about in the beginning of this one. So <laughs> and I five think by five VO2 I, uh, is too tough. <laughs> when I was younger, I used to call those like 30 thirties where they're like drop proofing yourself mm, so that you wouldn't I get like, like if you did a lot of 30 thirties, you're probably not going to get not going to get dropped. You have to do other training too, but, uh, I think that <laughs> it's like, you can always ride back on. If you can do a 30, 30, you can get dropped and ride back on. And then just, <laughs> you can do 30, 30 during the race, yeah. <laughs> just riding yourself back onto the, <laughs> onto the wheel. <laughs> All right. Kyle's question. Kyle says, Hey coaches, I've just been selected to join a local cycling team. We'll be contending the local weekly road race series from April until the 4th of July week. I've never raced so many races in such a short time period before. So I'm worried about the following number one, how do I perform well throughout the season? And number two, how do I avoid burnout? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Zach, I mean, you're in the lifetime grand prix right now. I know it's perhaps not as concentrated as this one of weekly April until July 4th, but I kind of wonder how do I perform well throughout the season? I mean, you can't peak from April to July. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think selecting when you start your training for next season, like taking an appropriately timed off season break coming up here shortly and, you know, understanding that you need to go through like, uh, you know, a, a steady build throughout base season, uh, and, and build towards that time period. Um, cause if you start, you know, you got selected today and if you, you're like, all oh, right, I'm super motivated. I'm just going to train from, you know, September, whatever day it is, September 15th, all the way to July 4th, like you're, you're going to burn out probably. Um, so I think, <laughs> you know, it, you know, I, the season's not over, weather's still warm, like take advantage of this fall but then take a nice off season break. Don't stress too much. And, um, you know, come up with an annual training plan that, that slowly builds you towards, I think you said April starting point. Um, and then, you know, but you don't want to be maybe, maybe if you're racing a ton from April to July, like you probably don't want to be in like tip top shape in April, probably want to leave something to be desired a little bit heading into those April races, because racing that often is going to, you know, sharpen the knife quite a bit. Um, so, you know, just timing your, your annual season around that and being aware that, you know, like I said, you can't peak the whole time. So you either need to show up maybe with, you know, a little, a little bit to be desired on your top end or anticipate a little drop off by the time July comes, if you're racing a ton, um, so whether or not you want to, you know, kind of front load it or back load it. I, for me, I think, the first races being a little bit, you know, not in your perfect shape and then really hitting your stride in that June, July, I think that's more motivating. Uh, so that's what I would do, but yeah, just being cognizant of the fact that that's a long, you know, a long dense season. So you're going to have to expect some fitness changes throughout. Yeah, with that sort of time frame of like April, May, June, and just touching into July, I would think that you would, so typically like if you can stretch a peak for four weeks, you're getting away with something and six weeks, you're really getting away with something, but that's pretty much it. Like, uh, and when I say stretch a peak, you're, if you're aiming to like, kind of like perform for four to six weeks, you're still probably to Zach's point, not going to perform as well as if you were just really focusing on one specific race you're probably going to perform better there. Um, so I would, yeah, pick your battles, like find the race that you really want to do well at. And, uh, in my mind, that would be somewhere in mid June. And then if you're, if you're racing weekly, 
pick something in mid June. And then that way, as you're getting closer to that, you're going to get better and better. And then once you hit mid June, you'll be firing, hitting your potential. And then you can probably make it last through 4th of July week. Right. And, uh, then at that point afterward, it's super important with these races too, Ryan, like to Zach, you mentioned like taking an off season now, but you, it'll be really tempting to just keep rolling because even though this race series ends, there's probably something else that you can do. Like, you know, you're talking middle of July, that's like bike race season, but it's super important to take time off after this sort of thing. Right. Ryan, like I'm sure you Absolutely. faced that. Like, cause I mean, you just went to Spain on a bike trip and like you, you're, you have a lot of opportunities to blow yourself up and just to continually race and do hard things all year. Yeah. Especially now it's, with all the gravel racing, the mountain bike racing, there's like three races every weekend from March until October that you could, that you could do if you wanted to. Um, and that's something I've done better this year is to take time to go have fun riding your bike. So I think for like looking at a season that goes from April to early July, like Zach said too, and, and to bring back the, the cyclocross, um, idea as well. Like maybe it's good to use some of those races early in the season as training races where you're not like, you're kind of figuring out where, where you fit in the team as well. Um, and that's something that we didn't touch on is what the, like knowing what the expectations of your team mm. are. Um, are you expected to be at all of the races or, can you take, can you take a weekend off or, or miss a race on some weekend in May and go do a big, a big fun ride with your friends instead of racing? Cause I think that, um, mm. that for me is what has helped, uh, combating the burnout throughout the season is like, you really want to go to this race, but yes, it's still like I went to um, BC bike race instead of doing crusher in the tusher because crusher to me is not one of my favorite races of the year. And BC bike race is way harder because it's a week of <laughs> like three hour mountain bike, like gnarly mountain bike stages. But mentally for me doing, um, BC bike race, it's like you come back from that and you're like, you're still motivated to train and to ride and to like have fun doing it. So I think there's, there is opportunities to, whether it's missing, missing one race, um, to do a, another race that you're more excited about or to go, go backpacking with your friends in the, in the mountains or do, um, I don't know what else you can do in May. It's not ski trip season, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think like incorporating something else that, gets you excited. Like none of us are, um, racing world tour. So we don't have to do anything. Like if something sounds yeah. more exciting to us, we should go do it. Um, it's yeah. not like, it's not like they're telling, uh, Zach that he can't work for me. <laughs> he's, he's supposed to win this, not yeah. me, even though I'm in the lead right now. Yeah. <laughs> To bring in a <laughs> getting personal. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't bring it in. No, no, no. Uh, Zach, this is like a question that I have for like how to manage burnout. For me, I feel like I don't really get, and it's probably because I haven't reached this point. I haven't gotten burnt out because of racing too much necessarily, but I do get burned out like mentally and psychologically when my expectations aren't matching what I can achieve. Like I just place too high of expectations for myself. Cause then it's like, super frustrating and a mental drain, but uh, how have you managed it? Maybe this year has been like your first time through like this long sort of weird season too with lifetime grand prix. Has it been tough? Yeah. I mean, it's uh it's kind of cliche now, but I like, you just gotta like trust the process and, and love the process because you, and just view coming up short on whatever expectations you set for yourself as just part of the process. Like, failure is the mother of all success. Like it, you know, try to always find, you know, a little lesson you learned, like, why'd you get dropped? You know, why'd you, what, what, what went wrong and what can you do better to fix it? 
um, and just being like rolling with whatever, you know, came up in whatever aspect you came up short, just try to like become one with that and get better. Um, but yeah, if you let it crush you, then it's, it's gonna, it will crush you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of the same way. I really love racing. So I don't really like, you know, I don't care if it's on the gravel bike or the road bike or the mountain bike. Like it, it's really fun to me, even when I don't perform super well, like I'll throw into like a late seat, like this season we're racing into October, but like in seasons past, I will typically take a break like in September and then I'll throw into like a cyclocross race in like early November. And I know I'm completely out of shape and guys that I can always beat, beat me, but I, you know, I still have a really good time. I recognize it for what it is, which is just like fun and a little, you know, a little workout, but mostly just for fun. And, you know, just, but yeah, you know, I can still identify things that I, I can work on and it's, uh, and just like keeping a positive mindset around it is super important. I think one thing that helps me with, uh, so I'm thinking of you, Kyle, you're going to be racing every week going through this. I would set different goals for every week that are not based on like, I want to finish like whatever your main goal is for mid June for when you really want to like be performing well, don't set that goal yet. Like in those earlier races, make it be like one where I want to position myself in a spot where I don't miss the crucial moves or today I want to try to initiate an early break and see if we can make that stick. Or my goal today is to chase everything down for a teammate, like set those different goals that you'll have that you can accomplish that are like a process goal that are within your control. And that will make every race something interesting and fresh. Because if you're just like, you go into everyone, you're like, I'm going to win today. I'm going to win today. There's so many things like only one person wins in a bike race. It's really tough to, to, unless you're truly dominant and your name's Keegan, it's really tough to do that. Um, like, you know, to just win everything all the time. So in that case, even, you know, you just go through and you set those different goals and then it's really motivating. And then by the time you'll show up to when you really want to perform, you'll have this like really broad bank of experience and confidence where you were like, in this race, I was able to react to this scenario because I focused on it. So you've got like another, another uh, tool in your tool chest that you can use on race day when it really matters, um, to, to make that successful. And that's, that's a good way. If you do have a lot of racing, um, it can be really tempting to just go into the first one and be like, I need to see where I'm at and I just need to claw my way up and get to that win. But if you do that, that's, that can really become demotivating because a lot of that's out of your control. So instead focus on the things you can control when your fitness isn't peaking yet. And that can give you a long runway, uh, to work with and, and keep motivation. Sorry, Ryan. Oh, I was, I was just gonna say, even if, even if you are dominant and and you can win every race of the season, think of, you can think of different ways to win. Like let it, mm -hmm. let it come down to a sprint because you don't usually get into sprints or let it like get in the early break or try, yeah, try something different. Go with, go with one K to go and see if you can hold it or yeah. Road tactics are not my thing, but, uh, <laughs> I think making it, uh, yeah. Coming up with other ways to challenge yourself whether it's for the win or whether it's for like truly working as a team with your with your team like make one race where you never are more than three riders away from the other six people on your team where you you are a unit mm -hmm. working together um because i think that that'll be more valuable late in the season. If you guys can ride as a, as a cohesive team, um, and work together and have the same goal and you know how to execute that. I think that's more valuable than like one super strong guy on the team winning every race. I think if you can actually work together and learn to work as a team, then everyone can have a chance to win win a race, um, and do it in, in different ways yeah. as well. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Last Not question. Devin, like he says, I'm a soft, oh, 
Yeah, not everyone Sorry. is. Yeah, yeah it's not. <laughs> yeah, just I'm sure he's. I'm same, sure he's the yeah. same way every time. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, yeah. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I, I bet he's getting. <laughs> yeah, I bet he's getting kind of bored too. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Devin says, "I'm a sophomore in high school and starting the college application process. I've raced NICA, which is our in the United States, the National Interscholastic Cycling Association, the high school and middle school mountain bike racing league." Uh, I've raced NICA for the last two years and had great results so far in varsity this year. Top tens. Great job on, um, already varsity and top 10. That's super impressive. Mm -hmm. I have a dream of racing pro gravel and MTB. This is why I picked this question since I got you guys here and I'll likely have the chance to get some level of scholarship from cycling to attend college, but I'm wondering if this is the best approach. Maybe you can ask some of the pros you have on the podcast if they recommend going through collegiate cycling pathways or just focusing on racing events on my own, uh, from Devin. I, I know Ryan, you race collegiate Zach. I don't know mm -hmm. if you race collegiate. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I mean, bit. we okay, definitely yeah, had different yeah. approaches. So what do you, what do you think, yeah. Zach? I mean, so like Ryan went to Fort Lewis, which has an awesome heritage for collegiate cycling, probably more so than any other school in the country. Um, and I ended up going to the university of Utah, which is just, you know, like an hour away from where I grew up. Um, and I really liked that. And, you know, I thought about going to like a more cycling focused school, like, uh, for example, the university of Utah is like a big school, but we actually compete with the way of being a club sport. We compete in like the lower division with like CU Boulder, but some of these smaller schools that have like actual funding for their cycling team, um, they compete in the, in the varsity. Uh, or I think they call it varsity and I can't remember what the designation was for CU and Utah and that division. Um, but even, even going to a school that had less of a focus on collegiate cycling and like, you know, we're planning our own accommodations, maybe like six of us went to nationals. Uh, I had a ton of fun. I think collegiate cycling is definitely worth pursuing. Uh, especially if you go to a school like, the University of Utah, you're you're going to have to participate in the leadership of the team and planning things and like encouraging people to come on rides and come to races and maybe even planning a race. Um, and I think getting stuck in that side of things was kind of cool in my collegiate career too. And it's just a ton of fun. Like, um, that you're I don't know if you're necessarily encouraged to do downhill and cross country at collegiate mountain bike mats, but there is an omnium category for the overall winner, which I found is unique to collegiate. And I always jumped at the opportunity for that because I race XC all year. And it was really fun to jump into that. And, you know, you get to meet new people at different schools. I still have friends that I met at collegiate Nats, So certainly worth pursuing, whether you go, you know, the Fort Lewis, CMU, Brevard, cat, you know, type school that has like, you know, a full on team with a trailer and, you don't have to worry about accommodations. Or if you go to a school that's, you go for the school aspect, not necessarily the cycling aspect, but make the cycling thing happen, I think is, I think it's worth it. It's really fun. Yeah. And I guess collegiate racing doesn't really replace doing other events too. And I think that that's like a big, it's not like they're mutually exclusive. Like Ryan, I'm sure that you'd raced, did other races as well while you were still racing collegiate. Yeah, absolutely. I did. I guess, yeah, going to Fort Lewis, uh, where it was when I first started there, it was still a club sport. It was like before the whole varsity club thing that kind of happened while I was at school. Um, but it was still a huge program. And like Zach said, we, like, we didn't organize any of the accommodations or, um, any of the travel, but we did, like we would travel with 85 college students each like to a mountain bike race where we camp in the parking wow. lot of, of a ski resort. And then you're camping with CU and CMU and all these other um, schools and you get to know people and you like race against Sepp and Howard and Payson and uh, who else was there? Uh, I don't remember. Is Keegan but, there? Like all those, no, Keegan didn't go to college. <laughs> Bro, 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I don't think he did. But right? Sophia yeah. did. Yeah. Sophia was yeah. there. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Sarah Sturm uh-huh. and like all these, like that was a crazy time at Fort Lewis or to be at school in, in Colorado at college. But I think what a crew. for me, the, like the racing wasn't like, yeah, it was, it was fun, but the, the aspect of going and camping with all of your, all of your friends, it was, was fun for the mountain bike season. And then the, the road season, they stayed in hotels, but we would always, there was always friends to go to, um, we would do the pro XCTs in the spring instead of going to road races and we'd go, um, drive to, or drive down to Prescott for whiskey 50 and camp for camp for the weekend or find someone to sleep on their couch. Um, and I think that was more, I think, I don't know. I look back at my college experience and yes, cycling was a big part of it, but it wasn't, and I wanted to do it professionally, but the, idea of I don't know being away from home and being at Mm -hmm. at school and learning like you can find something that you're you never knew that you were interested in and it gives you an opportunity like like Zach you can go get a get a job but still race your bike at the highest level of the sport in the country and I think and how old are you Zach you're 26 27 26 24, 26, 26. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, no, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, like I went to, went to college and then worked for, I think like last year was my first year racing full time and I was 28. And I think that's something that yeah. if you, if you really, really want to do it, there's ways to make it happen and it can take a long time. But if, if it's something that you truly want to do and, and I think if you go to college, you might decide that it's not what you truly want to do. Um, Mm -hmm. and you find that you have interests in, in other things and you still love riding your bike, but you realize that cycling isn't the career that you want. Um, not to, that's not, not a negative thing in any way, but there's a lot of kids that I went to college with that when they first came in, they were like, I am like, I'm here for the cycling team and I'm going to be a professional. And then they end up finding something that they're more passionate about. And I think that's the cool, that's, that's why I would go to college is to find, find out what you want to do. And maybe it is racing bikes, but, um, yeah it's hard (laughs) yeah yeah this is uh i think a good you're probably not going to get any sort of um like our collegiate pathways in the united states aren't a spot where you're going to get recognized by teams teams aren't going there and like scouting and doing that sort of thing it's not common like instead it's all kind of just like more or less one community and i think that if you are doing collegiate racing you're probably going to rub shoulders with a lot of people that will either give you the inspiration that you need or give you the perspective that you need to know where you want to take your, your career, like you said, Ryan, and also probably introduce you to companies and teams and everything else. It's just putting you in the right spot. I think it like doing more of it. So yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me if I could do it all again, I didn't cycle at all in any form when I was in high school. Um, I wish that I did. And then went to a college for, for like bikes would have been so cool. That would have been a blast. Um, Dirt bikes wasn't quite the same. I haven't seen any dirt bike teams. Uh, and that was me as a kid. So, uh, <laughs> they don't want those kids at college anyway. So, uh, yeah. well, Zach, Ryan, thanks a bunch, man. I'm stoked to, uh, stoked to have you guys on. I'm wearing, uh, for everybody that knows I'm wearing Ryan's shirt. It's the gravel beef shirt. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it right now. I'll flip around. Very nice. It's got choice <laughs> cuts. It's called gravel beef. It's pretty sweet. <clears throat> so, uh, you can support. There's going to be a rocket couple slot left. Cut. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. So hurry fast. Have, um, yeah. Well, I have to, I have to put them up on the website, so they're not, they're not available yeah. just yet because travel and doing all this yes. <laughs> makes it hard. Well, there are other balance, things that but, you can get at rocket sloth. Go get yeah. those things to support Ryan and his racing. It'd be awesome. 
uh, Zach, go follow Zach. Zach, how can they follow you on Instagram? Yeah, just at Zach Colton, Z-A-C-H-C-A-L-T-O-N. And then same name on Strava. I'll, I use Strava too. Those are my two social medias. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, so go follow him, go follow Ryan, uh, support these guys. And if you're listening to this and you haven't submitted a question yet, go to trainerroadcom slash podcast. If you haven't rated the podcast, we'd appreciate it or subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're getting real close to hundred K on YouTube, which would be great. Let's pass that. And then also, um, go sign up for trainer road, go check it out. We've got exciting things coming here. Um, I'm not going to give timelines, but exciting things coming. So stay tuned. Uh, good stuff. We'll talk to you all next time. Thanks. Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan.